Gospel Commentary for the Sixth Sunday After Pentecost by St. John Chrysostom. The Gospel According to St. Matthew, chapter 9, verses 1 through 8. Just as bees fly about the fields, gathering from every plant and flower things most excellent and useful, so also do they who, in the love of God, are like the bees, in industriousness, and orderliness sweeten their souls with the sweetness of divine words, gathering from them all things appropriate and useful. From some they gather flowers of chastity, from others justice, for some flowers of wisdom, from others courage, from some flowers of kindness and philanthropy toward neighbor, meekness and calmness. From others they gather patience and forbearance and adversities. Simply put, from all they gather, as from flowers, all things suitable for the soul's salvation, and placing them in the storehouses of the heart, they make the sweet honey of virtue, which is sweeter than honey and the honeycomb, and store up everlasting fruits. Let us also be like them, brethren. When we come to the divine and beautiful refuge of the church, let us not gather for conversation, to talk with one another, but rather to look into the divine words being read for our salvation. Let us carefully seek spiritual profit in them with a concerned heart and searching disposition. By abiding in such a state, we are sometimes taught about one virtue, and at other times instructed in another, and yet again we speak about still another. From frequent instructions in these things, we benefit and become able to practice the virtues ourselves. The sweetness and light engendered by them in our souls we shall offer to God as honey and the honeycomb. The divine scriptures even propose and teach things which are pleasing to God and conductive to our salvation. There is nothing more spiritually profitable than them. Since these things are so, let us understand today from the words of the gospel what a great evil sin is, and that it does great harm to the soul and that therefore it often becomes a cause of bodily infirmities. This is what is offered to us today. From the Gospel. At that time Jesus entered into a ship and passed over and came into his own city. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying in a bed. The Lord left the country of the Gergesenes, as they asked him to do, and having lost their swine, the Gergesenes feared that they would somehow suffer from some other harm. Therefore, they begged Christ and besought him that he would depart out of their coasts. They were unworthy of the master's teaching. Christ did not resist them, but departed quietly and meekly. For where men live like swine, in mire and in stench, and in absence of good works, there Christ does not abide. He left there the swine herds and the men who were delivered from the demons to tell and proclaim the miracles which had taken place. From the Gospel. And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy lying in a bed. Since all the skill of physicians had proven ineffectual in this case, of the palsy that is, this man was brought by his relatives to the high and heavenly physician, our Lord Jesus Christ. Many who simply read the divine scriptures without study think that all four evangelists speak of one and the same paralytic, hence some reproach the evangelists for contradicting one another and not being in agreement. This is not so. It cannot be so, for the same grace of the Holy Spirit was at work in all of them. Where the grace of the Holy Spirit is present, there love, joy, and peace are found. And where there is peace, all dissension and opposition are dispelled. All doubt and disagreement perish. To those who investigate the matter carefully, the place, time, day, and manner of healing, as well as other details, attest that this man, sick of the palsy, is just one person, and the paralytic of whom the evangelist John the Theologian speaks is another. The latter was healed in Jerusalem, the former in Capernaum. That man, of whom St. John speaks, was at a pool, this one at a certain house, as Luke and Mark relate. That paralytic received healing during the feast. This one, when there was no feast day, that man had his infirmity for 38 years, but of this one the evangelists say no such thing. 
That man was healed on the Sabbath day. This one, not on the Sabbath, for he had too been healed on the Sabbath. The evangelist would not have passed over such a fact in silence, nor would the Jews have kept silent about it. This paralytic was brought to Christ on the arms of others. To the other one, Christ came himself. That paralytic has no one to help him. And he said, Sir, I have no man. But this man had many people close to him uh, who carried him and brought him to Jesus. Furthermore, the circumstances of the healing are different in each case. With the other man, Christ healed his body before his soul. His first, he first cured the paralysis, and then he said, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. Here it is otherwise. Christ first healed his soul, saying, Thy sins be forgiven thee, and then he remedied the palsy of the body. About the paralytic, the scribes and Pharisees remained silent, whereas about the other man they were quick to complain, slandering and persecuting Jesus. Thus, these two paralytics are different men, as is clear and conclusively proven by the facts. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, and we stop there. The truly uh, pleasing was the faith of those who brought the paralytic to the good physician and savior, whom could see uh, what was in their hearts. Some say that the Lord looked upon the faith, not of the paralytic, but of them that brought him. It does not happen that one man receives healing through the faith of others, as at the baptism of infants, where the faith of the parents who bring them is active or as when the Canaanite woman believed and her daughter received healing. Also the centurion believed and his servant arose. So here also, they say, the paralytic received healing on account of the faith of the men who brought him. However, this is not so. Jesus seeing their faith, it says, meaning not the faith of those who brought him, but also of the paralytic. One person is not saved because others believe, except in the case of one not yet come of age, as we have said of infants, or cases of extreme infirmity, when those bound by infirmities are insensible, and it is therefore impossible for them to believe, as with the Canaanite woman's daughter. As she said, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil, oft times she falleth into the fire, and oft into the water. The possessed girl uh, would have been unable ever to regain her right mind, how could she have come to believe? Similarly, in the case of the centurion, his servant lay at home sick, and he never had any knowledge of who Christ was. How could he have believed in someone unknown to him? In such circumstances, one is saved through the faith of another. The same cannot be said in the present instance, for the paralytic who undoubtedly believed, as is clear for many reasons, we can understand how difficult it is for any sick person to suffer and endure such things as did the paralytic. Indeed, ye know that the sick are so faint-hearted and ill-disposed as to reject and drive away treatment on their beds. Often they think it better to bear the pains of illness than to put up with the difficulty and discomfort connected with the onset of treatment. This paralytic, however, chose to leave his house and put up with being carried through the marketplace, and did not shrink from appearing in the sight of all, whereas ordinarily the sick do not wish anyone to be a witness to their debilitating. And many have uh, preferred rather to die in their infirmities than to re reveal and expose their misfortune to all. But the paralytic was not such a man, nor did he complain to his bearers and say, What is this? Why the com commotion? Why do you force me? Let us forbear and wait for people to disappear, and then we can approach the physician alone and tell him about my cruel illness. What use will it be for me to lay out my misery in the midst of all the onlookers? He did not say any of these things. He considered it beautiful and splendid to have so many witnesses of his malady and healing. Not only is this the paralytic's faith to be seen, but also from Christ's own words. When he was brought in, Christ said to him, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. The man was not upset or disappointed, nor did he say to the good physician, What are these words, Lord? I came to be healed of the suffering of palsy, but thou treatest other things. To forgive invisible sins is an illusion, an excuse to conceal the inability to heal. Nothing of the sort did he say or even think. He waited, leaving it to the physician and Savior to make him whole in his mercy and love towards man. The Lord, to show that faith 
is fatal to sin, said loudly to the man sick with the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. The master does not immediately proceed to heal the palsy. First, he healed that which was known to him alone, that is, he absolved the sins of the soul. In saving the palsied man, he was not gaining any great glory, nor did he desire to do anything to show or please men. Thus, he first forgives the sick, man, sick man's sins, and afterwards he heals his body also, teaching us that many illnesses spring from sin, and that the first one must be cured of the cause. He shows that he is God, and he does all things whatsoever he wills. For the saints also had power to heal bodily ailments, but to forgive sins is proper to God alone. In the same way, he also said to the paralytic at the pool, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon thee. For the source and root and mother of all evils is sin, which paralyzes our bodies and brings on illnesses. To show this, the Lord said to the paralytic, Thy sins be forgiven thee. And to the other man, who lay for thirty-eight years in his infirmity, he said, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. In the early days of the created world, infirmity entered the body of Cain because of sin. After he killed his brother, his body was greatly weakened, and he went about the earth sighing and shaking. This shaking is nothing else but the palsy. When the strength which uh, moves an animal is exhausted, and he can no longer support all his members, but leaves them devoid of his guidance, the palsied members tremble and move about uselessly. The divine Paul also testified to this when, in reproaching the Corinthians with certain sins, he said, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Christ also said, the sin, Thy sins be forgiven thee, that we might understand that as God, he visits man silently and imperceptibly, and sees each man's way of life, as it is written, The way of a man are before the eyes of God, and he looks on all his paths. As God is good and desires to save all men, he often permits men, held by sin, to fall ill, so that he may wash and wipe them clean from sin. He says through the voice of the prophet Jeremiah, With sickness and wounds wilt thou be punished, O Jerusalem. And the author of Proverbs says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loves, he rebukes, and scourges every son whom he receives. First of all, Christ cut away the root of suffering sin once it was uprooted. Sickness had to be uprooted together with it. In saying, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee, he restores the senses of the palsied man. He restores his injured soul. The word becomes fact. He touched the very soul of the man who came to his senses, and he cast out all fear. Nothing causes such fear as the consciousness of sin. Likewise, Nothing bestows such sweetness and gives such hope as feeling oneself free from blame. The Lord calls the paralytic son, either in the sense of a creature of the world, or because the man believed, or because he willed to grant him the remission of his sins, wherein the adoption of sons is also confirmed. So it is also with us, brethren. We cannot call God our Father until we have washed away our sins in the font of baptism and repentance. When we have emerged from it, and have cast aside the evil burden of sin, then do we say, Our Father, who art in heaven. The Gospel continues, And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. The scribes were offended and upset, being consumed with jealousy and envy. Often they saw Christ driving out disease by his own power and casting out demons and commanding the winds and the seas, and doing all these things in a way that no man could do. Nevertheless, in giving vent to their passions, they imagined that they were standing up for God's honor. They bribed others with gifts, and at the same time, they were vexed with indignation. They complained and reproached the Master and Savior with blasphemy. Uh, the Gospel continues, And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? Uh, here Christ now irrefutably and openly manifests the wonder of his divinity and his equality with the Father, for to know the thoughts of men's hearts is proper to God alone, as it is the remission of sins. As it is written, Thou alone knowest the heart of the children of men, and again, O God, thou searchest out the hearts and reins. In another place man looks at the outward appearance, and God looks at the heart. The scribes, however, did not accept Christ's forgiveness of sins.
It seems impossible to them. Therefore, Christ further said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? These words were irrefutable. By them he confirmed and lent support to what he had said earlier. He as much as said to the scribes, Indeed, no, no one can forgive sins but him who alone knows men's thoughts. For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. Uh, since you think me a blasphemer, O scribes, because I forgive sins and equate myself with God, teach me which of these is easier and quicker to do, to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. Both of these things about which Christ asked them are possible for God, but impossible for man. For to remit sins belongs to God alone, and does as also does the uh, raising of the paralytic by divine power and the restoration of his strength. It is proper for the master to punish an offending servant, but God sends affliction. When God sends affliction, however, he is beckoning man back to his love in order to relieve his sickness. When remission of sickness comes remission of sin, on account of which the affliction was permitted. If the Lord heals, clearly it is he who sent the punishment. <clears throat> if he punishes, he clearly has the power to end the punishment. And if he lifts the punishment, he surely forgives the offense on account of which the punishment was permitted. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, that ye may know, he said, that he whom ye see to be a man has power as God, behold, and understand the unknown and unseen from that which is revealed, being the word of God. I became man in my dispensation. I dwell and walk on the earth and grant remission of sins to them that believe in me. For this reason, he said, on earth to show that he who is God by nature also appeared on earth. Moreover, we are to understand that on earth sins are forgiven. As long as we are on this earth, brethren, we can expunge our sins, but when we shall pass from this world, we shall no longer be able to wash them away by confession, and the doors will be shut. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. Since the remission of sins gives no visible evidence to, of itself, while the raising of the paralytic by divine power required visible evidence, Christ performs a sign as testimony before all. The visible evidence of the one also bears witness to the other. He who is able to do the one could also do the other, to proclaim and confirm the healing of the paralytic's body. He told him to take up his bed, lest what had happened should seem to be some sort of illusion. The Lord further sends the paralytic to his house by himself, so that the man would not immediately begin to praise him in his presence. Also, so that there would be witnesses who would have an occasion for faith in him. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such power unto men. The people marveled, because he performed a sign of God. Nevertheless, they regarded him as a man, albeit one with greater than human power. We too, brethren, in what we are paralyzed and our spiritual faculties are an insensate, can be healed and set aright, if only we desire and will it. Even now Christ is in his own city, Capernaum, which means the house of consolation, that is the church, for the church is the house of the comforter. And we also, palsied in soul, having souls which are uh, inactive and unmoving to good, yet if we are taken up by repentance and confession and are brought to Christ, then we shall hear his sweet and all-powerful voice saying, Children, your sins are forgiven you. For we become children of God when we turn to him in repentance and sincere confession. Then we shall straightway be healed and shall take up our beds, that is, our bodies, as we strive to fulfill the commandments. Not only must we rise up from sin or merely understand that we are sinning, but we must also take up our beds, our bodies, and go on to do good works. Then, when our minds have seen and spiritually understood the many and great works of the Master for our sake, and have attained to such a height of vision 
then they will glorify God who works such wonders for to him is due glory unto the ages of ages. Amen.